Welcome again. Welcome back, everyone. Lecture 52, Chemistry, Part 10. Okay. Um, we're going to talk a bit about liquid mixtures. I'll give some definitions and do a bunch of talking. Okay. So let's see. Uh, liquid mixtures, we have a solute, the substance being dissolved, and the solvent, the substance doing the dissolving. Okay, so for example, uh, sugar water. Water is the solvent and sugar is the solute. Okay, if the solvent is not water, if it's alcohol, this is called a tincture. So that's a good word to know. Tinctures are used in hospitals all the time. So tinctures are just solutions where the solvent is made of alcohol. And the same if you have a martini or a drink. So if the bartender says, would you like another tincture? You know, the bartender is probably an out of work chemist. Ha. Okay, so let's uh, review one little thing before we talk about uh, some of the definitions and things uh, like dissolves like so let's explain this All right you know when you add uh, uh, oil and water and they don't mix okay well there's a simple rule we use uh, this like dissolves like what do I mean by like uh, like means something similar to yourself okay so nonpolar molecules will dissolve in nonpolar molecules so if you have a solute that's nonpolar, it will dissolve in a solvent that's also nonpolar, okay? By the same token, if you have a polar molecule, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, if you have a polar molecule that is a solute, it will dissolve in a solvent that is also polar. But if you have a solute that's nonpolar, it will not dissolve in a polar solvent. OK, now, what do I mean by polar and nonpolar? Well, in a molecule, when you put substance A together and substance B, the electrons somehow are acting between substance A and substance B. If A and B are covalent, then they're sharing electrons. If the molecule is ionic, if the bond is ionic, then one molecule is giving electrons, the other one is taking electrons, okay? So there's going to be electrons on more on one side than the other. So just like in society, when we say society is polarized, we believe in this, we don't believe in this. A, B, yes, no, up, down, okay? Molecules that are polar uh, are molecules wherein the electrons are not shared equally. OK, there could be a preponderance of electro more electrons or more charge on one side of the molecule as the other. On the other hand, if you have an O2 or N2 or I2 or any molecule like that, if I have uh, 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 an N2 molecule, two nitrogen atoms, well, it's clear they're exactly equal. So electrons are not going to be more on one or more on the other. And again, all of these things that I wrote, N2, O2, I2, they're all covalent. They're sharing. Okay. And generally, ionic substances are going to be polar. The best example, the best example of a polar molecule now is water. So let's talk. Uh, does oil dissolve in water? The answer is no. Now, we just said that water is a very polar molecule. Okay. The hydrogens, right? The hydrogens give up their electrons or go, go to the electrons to go to fill the... Uh, outer shell, the valence shell of the oxygen, okay? And so the uh, electronic structure or distribution of charge is uneven in water. That's why it's polar. So if oil does not dissolve in water, and we know that water is polar, what does that mean? It means oil is nonpolar. So oil is nonpolar. If I then try to take a polar molecule and dissolve it in oil, what do you think would happen? Well, we just said that oil is nonpolar. So our prediction would be a polar molecule, if we tried to dissolve it in oil and it doesn't dissolve, we know that molecule is polar, okay? If it does dissolve, whatever molecule it is, if it dissolves in oil, we know that it's nonpolar because oil is nonpolar. And we know that because oil and water do not mix. So we can play detective and do some deducing, okay? Uh, very quickly, uh, the expression saturated and supersaturated. All right, if you have a cup of coffee and you add sugar, you like sugar. I don't drink sugar, but if you like sugar, you put in so much sugar until eventually the sugar can't 
uh, uh, be absorbed, right? It's, it's not mixing. It just settles on the bottom. We'd say that solution is saturated. No more sugar, okay? In, uh, in chemistry, in the lab, in certain special situations, if the theoretical limit, if the science says you can only add X amount of solute to this solvent, that's it, and it's saturated. In certain circumstances, you actually, under perfectly ideal situations, you can add slightly more solute into the solvent than we would say it was a super saturated solution. Okay? So saturation means you just can't take it anymore. All right, I'm going to talk briefly some factors affecting solubility. And uh, I left space to show you a couple things. So let's talk about temperature. All right, what do we have? Well, it's clear that if we talk about solids in liquids, so if I have sugar in water or sugar in coffee or sugar in tea, everyone knows that you can dissolve more sugar in a hot cup of coffee than you can in a cold cup of coffee. Okay, so when we have, so see if you understand this, okay? So if I have a solid in a liquid, in L, S in L, okay? As the temperature goes up, the solubility goes up. It's a good rule. Temperature goes up, solubility goes up. Okay? And that's for a solid in a liquid. Okay? What if we have, I'll erase this. What if we have a gas in a liquid? Like when you have a bottle of soda, right? If you have soda or pop or something or beer, yeah? uh, and there's bubbles, carbon dioxide bubbles. What happens to the solubility of those bubbles as you heat the solution? Well, as you heat the solution, what are you doing? You're adding energy. As you add energy, the kinetic energy increases. And you know that if it's a hot day and you open a can of soda, it explodes. So as you heat up the system, the bubbles want to get out. So what happens to the solubility of a gas in a liquid? As the temperature increases, the solubility goes down. Okay? But again, if you have a solid in a liquid, sugar in water, sugar in coffee, sugar in tea, as you increase the temperature, in general, there are a few exceptions. In general, overall, as you increase the temperature, the solubility increases of a solid in a liquid. All right, so be careful of that. All right, let's talk a bit about pressure. Okay, suppose I have two liquids mixing. What happens if you increase the pressure? How do you increase the pressure? Well, if you're at sea level, remember, you have the entire atmosphere pushing down on you. If you're in Denver, one mile up, you have less atmosphere, hence less pressure pushing down. Remember, in Denver, water boils at a lower temperature. There's less pressure, air pressure, pushing down. And so the water molecules evaporating, evaporation, they, they can escape. Okay, Evaporation is the escaping of particles with a lot of kinetic energy. If the particles with a lot of kinetic energy are escaping, then it's clear that evaporation, because you're losing high energy particles, evaporation is a cooling process. Write that down. Evaporation is a cooling process. How do you know? Well, if you put rubbing alcohol on your arm, how does it feel? Well, it's cool because the alcohol uh, evaporates. So pressure, when you have two liquids has no effect. What if you have sugar? Suppose you put sugar in your coffee and you do it in Denver or you do it at sea level. It has no effect. Pressure has no effect. Solids in liquids, no effect at all. But now when we come to uh, um, uh, gases in liquids, okay, remember the bubbles are trying to escape. The bubbles are trying to escape. If you increase the temperature, if you increase the temperature, the bubbles escape even more. So as you increase the temperature of a gas in a liquid, the solubility decreases. Okay, the solubility decreases. Pressure has no effect on solids 
in liquids or liquids in liquids, okay? But a gas in a liquid, if you increase the temperature, the particles want to escape more, okay? So the solubility goes down, all right? Just common sense. If you think about it, you don't need anybody to tell you. If you just sit and think about what's happening and physically heating something up, giving energy, bubbles escaping, and so forth, okay? It's not that hard. All right, finally, surface area. Surface area, everybody look, um, when you take a pill, so you take a big pill, it goes down in your stomach and your gut and the digestive juices, the uh, hydrochloric acid and so forth have to dissolve it. Well, how does it dissolve it? It interacts with the surface area. That's the contact area, okay? That's why you get capsules, right, for medicine that act faster. The uh, gelatin dissolves, and you have zillions of little particles in there with lots of surface area. So the surface area, what that does is it does not, does not increase the solubility. This is tricky. Surface area does not increase the solubility, but it does increase the rate of, of how, how fast it will, it will uh, interact, how, how fast it will become soluble, okay? So if you have a big pill, it takes longer to dissolve. If you break that pill up, chop it up, piece of an aspirin, chop it up into a powder, drink that with some water, it will dissolve faster because there's more surface area. Not You will not be able to dissolve more. So the solubility does not change with surface area, just the rate, okay? The rate at which uh, it becomes soluble. Okay, very quickly, there's a, a, a classification of solids, uh, of uh, solutions. Uh, solids inside uh, liquid solutions, uh, liquid solvents, and it's all based on particle size, okay? True solutions, and again, I, I, I'm not interested in the specifics on how many, how many micrometers the uh, particulate size is. It's not important, but just know that in a true solution, the uh, particulates, the uh, solute particles are really, 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 really small. You can't see them, okay? So they're the smallest. They cannot be filtered. Remember, what is a filter? What is filtration? Filtration is a screen to keep the bugs out. If your screen size is this big, see, that's big, then everything can get through it, right? So you need a very small screen size, small mesh, and so the particles cannot pass through. Well, in a true solution, the particulates are so small that they pass through any filter paper, okay? Uh, true solutions are transparent. They're homogeneous. Um, they cannot be filtered. Well, we said that the, uh, you can't see the part. No Tyndall effect, okay? Let's look at Tyndall effect real quick. Tyndall effect is where you have a solution. Let's say this is my solution, okay? There's a solution there. Okay, okay, that's ugly, all right? Suppose you shoot a laser. If the laser passes right through that solution, it means when the light goes through, the particles are very small. Okay, so if you think about water wave on the beach, if it hits a tiny pebble, that big wave, this is a pebble, the wave just sweeps right over it. So if the particulate size is much, very, very small compared to the wavelength of the uh, light, then nothing's going to happen. So there's no, t if it does, if the particles, if this is a particle or this is a rock and a wave comes in, it bounces off and scatters. That's called the Tyndall effect. Okay. True solutions do not have a Tyndall effect. Why? Because the particulates are so small. And if I come back in a week or an hour or two years or 10 years, the particulates do not settle out. Okay. In a true solution. All right, when the particles get a little lo larger, colloidal solutions, everybody knows about colloidal solutions. Usually the particle, the particles settle out. You have to shake it and mix it up, medicines and things like that. These can be filtered. Why can they be filtered? Because the particulate size is so big. Yes, there's a Tyndall effect. Once again, the particulate size is big enough to scatter the laser light. They're translucent, not transparent, translucent. Okay, uh, so it look uh, foggy if you like, uh, uh, hazy, uh, cloudy is the word I'm looking for. And the particulates eventually do settle. That's why if you have a medicine uh, that's a, a colloidal suspension, you gotta 
your uh, colloidal solution, you have to shake it up. And the same for suspensions, the particulate size are bigger. Once again, they can be filtered because the particulate size is so big. Yes, there's a Tyndall effect. Again, the particulate size is so big that the uh, 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 particles scatter light. The particles settle just like in a colloidal solution. Uh, okay, there's many, many details to these things and it's just not critical that we go into fine, fine uh, 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 details about what the definition of everything. Okay, so, all right. Finally, I just want to say a word about what's called an amalgam. Amalgams. Okay, an amalgam is a solid solution. How the heck can you have a solid solution? How could you mix two solids, really? All right. How you mix two solids is you melt them, and then you mix them. And an example is brass. Right. Everybody knows about brass. Brass is not an element. Brass is an amalgam of copper and zinc, I believe. So you melt some copper, melt some zinc and combine them together and you get brass. In the old days, the dentist used to give you a filling and it was made of silver with mercury. I don't know why they put mercury in it, but it was an amalgam of silver and mercury was the uh, tooth fillings. OK, so amalgam is a uh, solid solution. OK, in the next video, next lecture, what we'll talk about is how to measure concentration of liquid mixtures. All right. There's a thousand ways of measuring uh, uh, concentration. Right. If you have a cup of coffee, you could put two tables, tablespoons in. Right. And that's one cup. If I had twice the size of the cup and I wanted the same concentration of sugar, since I put two tablespoons in one cup, if I had two cups, I would put four tablespoons. If I had half a cup, I put one tablespoon. It's just a proportion. Right. So that would be the concentration is number of tablespoons of sugar per cup. Well, chemists are going to use a different definition and uh, we'll have many definitions, but we're going to talk about molarity as a measure of concentration in the next lecture. OK, and we'll do some simple problems with that and get that out of the way. All right. Be safe. See you next time. Peace. Take care.